Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about introduce myself, um, talk about some of the work that I've done uh, recently in my master's thesis, and then talk about the project that I've proposed to conduct here in Chile. So starting off with a little bit about me, I did my undergraduate at Occidental College, which is a small liberal arts college in LA. I have a degree in physics and geology from there. Um, I then worked, went on and worked for a few years and then went back to school and just finished up my master's with a degree in so I have worked all over California. So actually my first job out of college was doing a bunch of field work on the Eastern side of California. And then I worked in coastal restoration and access projects. So along the coast, I guess that means my next job used to be in the Central Valley so that I've really covered all of it. Um, but I love being outside. Here are some pictures of me outside. Um, <laughs> I'm happy um, and I'm hoping to be able to explore as much as possible while I'm in Chile. And uh, I also play and coach basketball and so I'm hoping to get involved with a club basketball team while I'm in Valparaiso, which is where I'm going to be located while I'm here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for the work and the questions that I'm interested in. Um, an intro to gender climatology, that's a big word, um, and then the master, some of the work that I've done in my master's thesis and the work that I hope to do here. We know that the world is getting hotter. Um, we know that places on the planet, um, that um, hydroclimate, that precipitation patterns will change differently in different places on the planet. Um, and you may have heard this phrase, the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. Uh, this is referring to the idea that um, there are places uh, places on the planet that receive relatively high amounts of precipitation right now. Um, we expect, like the like the poles and the tropical rain belt, we expect we'll receive even more amounts of precipitation um, as the planet warms. Places like the subtropical deserts, we expect to get even drier. Um, so there's really th strong theoretical understanding of how these places will change, but there's a lot more uncertainty about how places in between these broad regions will change. And um, Chile, the Mediterranean area in Chile, is one of these places where there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future of climate will look like, as well as California. Um, and so if you look at global climate models, some of them will show that um, things are getting broadly drier in, in these regions, and others will show that, we're get, that these places are getting wetter. Um, and so global climate models aren't particularly useful for addressing these, these questions. Um, and, and so another approach is a more empirical approach is to go back in time and look at in at times when climate has changed, um, when we've undergone warming events in the past, how has hydroclimate reacted um, to these past warming events. And so here we're looking at uh, instrumental measurements of temperature in the northern and southern hemisphere. You can see that these measurements actually don't go back that far in time. We only have instrumental measurements of temperature um, going back to the, the 18 um, 50s, and I think actually the oldest instrumental temperature measurement in Chile is, is in the 1860s. Um, and so if we want to understand this relationship between temperature and precipitation, we need a different way of looking at past climate, which is looking at proxy data. And so here are some of the really creative ways that humans have invented of understanding more about our past climate. Um, you can see ice core data, um, inf there's information in rocks and geology and sediments, so lake cores, corals, Heliothems, um, and then my focus is on tree rings. And so this is a tree, this is a cross section of a tree. Um, trees live in the environment. They don't get to go home on a cold rainy day and read a book or you know jump in a hot pool on a really hot day. They are stuck growing, um, living where they grow. And they are, uh, something really special about trees is they keep a record of their own growth. So here we're looking at growth rings on a tree. You may be familiar with the idea that um, each one of these rings, uh, for each year that the tree has been alive, we see a ring. Um, and so we can use this principle to uh, learn more about past environmental conditions. And so here you can see that I've marked the ring width of uh, a number of these rings. So we can see um, that the growth in this tree is not consistent from year to year to year. And then the question is, why? So we know that tree growth can be affected by a number of different variables. Uh, so precipitation, water availability, um, temperature, the temperature environment of the tree, competitive, the competitive environment. So are, are there other trees around this tree? Um, as well as there are some age-related growth effects that can, that can affect this pattern. Um, traditionally, 
uh, traditionally we look at, um, or we can think about wide rings as being times when growing conditions for a tree were really good, um, and narrow rings being times when, uh, or um, showing years where growing conditions for that tree for whatever reason were adverse. And so this idea has been used to reconstruct, uh, for, to, to create hundreds of climate reconstructions in the last century. Often these reconstructions rely on uh, sort of a, a simplification that we're looking at trees in places where the, the growth of that tree is constrained primarily by a single variable. Uh, so this makes pretty good intuitive sense, like a tree that grows in a very arid environment is probably primarily constrained by water availability. And so you can look at variations in water availability um, by looking at variations in ring width going back in time. Um, this is a very reasonable approach, an approach that has been used in a lot of ways. I'm really interested on in improvements to this approach. Um, and so that's some of the work that I've done in my master's thesis is um, thinking about how we think about <laughs> thinking about how we think about trees recording climate um, and how we can improve that. So one of the, the ways that this field is evolving is looking not just at ring width, but actually looking at cells um, th that make up the growth of trees. And it turns out that there's a lot more information about climate in the cells that make up ring growth or tree growth. Um, so in my master's thesis, I have um, developed a way of creating really high resolution images of tree cores um, and then trained a couple different AIs to be able to analyze those images um, and extract more information about past climate. Uh, so this is one of these really, you can see the cells in each one of these rings um, and you can see that there's some amount of variation in the ring width that we can see in this image. So we see some wider rings and some narrow rings. We can also see that each one of these rings is made up of individual cells and there's kind of two main types of cells. Um, so we have these larger cells with thinner cell walls. It turns out these are the um, the pipes that are moving water through the tree. And so uh, uh, there's information about water availability and hydroclimate in the size of these cells. And then um, these smaller cells with the much thicker cell walls, these are providing a lot of the structural support for the tree. And it turns out that there's a lot of information about temperature, um, specifically in the cell wall thickness. And so that's, the, I can talk a lot, a lot more about that, but <laughs> I will not. Um, my master's thesis this is some of the field work that I got to do for my master's thesis. Um, so here you can see me taking a sample of a tree. Um, so using this instrument called an increment borer, you go in and you take this small little slice of a tree. Um, and so here we can see here, like we're just taking the small slice and you can see that you're going through the ring, the, the um, growth history of that tree. In my lab, we then take that uh, sample and so you can see it being sanded. Uh, up there, send it to really, really just like obsessively. We don't need to go into that. Um, <laughs> and then it's imaged. So this is an instrument in the lab that uh, takes thousands of images of uh, a tree core and allows us to create these really, really high resolution images. Um, in my master's thesis, like I said, I've trained an AI to take an image of wood and produce a prediction, oh sorry, um, to, of the cells. So to be able to measure each one of these cells. Um, and that model is working really well. So this is, uh, you know, we're now zoomed out and looking at a ring structure picture, um, and we can see that each one of these cells has been detected and measured. Um, I don't know what happened with the formatting of this slide, sorry. Um, I also created a model, hello, model that categorizes these cells. Um, and so once I can categorize these cells, I can then detect the ring boundaries and assign a year to each one of the cells that I've categorized. So this, um, this is the state of my master's thesis work is, is um, developing this methodology for analyzing tree cores. Um, and in this next year, I am working with my advisor at home to apply this methodology to a large data set of trees that we have from California um, and to extract a climate reconstruct or to, to develop a climate reconstruction, um, a, a cell based climate reconstruction. So uh, that brings me to the work that I'm hoping to do here. There are a ton of parallels between uh, climate in Chile and climate in California, and we also share a lot of the same preoccupations about uh, what changing climate will look like um, think if you know um, as things are getting warmer 
we're more drought prone, we're more prone to fires. Um, and so there's, and we're producing a huge amount of food in both of these regions. So there's a really strong incentive to really understand um, as the planet gets warmer, how, how will water availability change? Um, so I, there are four dendroclimatology labs in Chile. Uh, I actually got to come down and visit last year on a grant funded to uh, improve collaboration between Chilean and Californian climate scientists. So we got to meet uh, all these different labs in Chile, which is really cool. This is actually me coring a peumo tree in, near Valparaíso. Um, and I'm going to be working with uh, Ariel Munoz, who runs the dendroclimatology lab at uh, the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Valparaíso. And um, we're still, you know, working out the exact details, but I'm going to be working with uh, species Cipres de la Cordillera is a species that has a lot of parallels with the species that I've studied in California um, and we know is sensitive to water availability. Um, and so the goal is to develop a hydroclimate reconstruction using the species um, and then to eventually compare how hydroclimate in Chile is changing um, in comparison to hydroclimate in California. Um, I'm also really excited to learn about approaches that they are taking to, to um, in, extract even more information about climate from tree rings. So they have a setup to do um, stable isotope analysis in their lab, which is an approach that I haven't really learned about. Um, so I'm hoping to learn more about that process and also share the information um, and the methodology that I've developed in my master's thesis and to hopefully develop continued relationships and continued connections for collaboration between labs in Chile and labs in California. Okay.